a researcher named Roberts has defined conscientiousness as the tendency to be planful, organized, task and goal oriented, self controlled, and to delay gratification and to follow norms and rules. So we looked at things too, like future discounting. You know, so future discounting would we could play a future discounting game. So I'll do that with you very quickly. So I'm going to point at you and ask you a question. And so you could, it's not a trick, by the way. So you don't have to worry about your answer. So I might say, Okay, here's the deal. I can give you $10 today, or I can give you $15 in a month. What would you take? $15 in a month. Okay, okay so fine. I, I give you $15 today, or $50 in a year. 15 today. 15 today, okay. I'll give you $5 today, or $50 in a year. $50 in a year. Okay, so now imagine that I played that game with one of you 100 times, say, or 200 times, using different amounts, small and big, over different time frames. And what you can calculate is how much people value the present compared to the future. Now, you should value the present a bit more than the future, right? Why? That's right. The future is uncertain. So, so you have to discount it. So, because, you know, there's some probability that it isn't just going to occur. Like, maybe something will happen, or maybe I'll, I won't be here. Or, and then the farther out you go into the future, the more you have to discount it, because it becomes really unpredictable. And, you know, my experience, and, and I don't really know of any data to support this, but my experience has been that it's, it's pretty hard to plan, in your life, it's pretty hard to plan more than three to five years into the future. Because, because there's so many variables that start to, the, the, the effect of the variables that you're not accounting for start to beca- starts to become exponential as you move out into the future. So, you should discount the future because the present is more certain. Plus, if you have $5 now, you can do something with it right now instead of waiting for two years to get your 50 and so that might be useful. But we thought that maybe conscientious people would discount the future less than unconscientious people, right? It, it sounds like they would because it's sort of like delay of gratification. Can you wait for your $50? And we found that there was no correlation whatsoever with conscientiousness. If people were extroverted, or if you made them happy, then they discounted the future more. And what, with the way we interpreted that was that, well, if things are going well now, you might as well capitalize on it. You know, if, if, because if all the s- signals that are coming towards you say, well, this is a good time, why not take the resources now and use them? So, anyways, that's, that's just an example of how tricky this is. And you, you'll notice, if you know anything about prefrontal cortical function theories, that all of these descriptions, planful, organized, task and goal-oriented, and so on, have been attributed to the prefrontal cortex. But that, that, uh, that we sure haven't found any evidence for that, even though it's the prime theory of prefrontal function. Okay, so what, what is conscientiousness associated with? Well, Deneve and Heller have showed that if you measure it over any reasonable amount of time, it's associated with life satisfaction and happiness. Now, you might want to ask yourself, well, what is life satisfaction or happiness? Which is a really good question, especially if you measure it with a questionnaire. Because we've already established that if you measure with a questionnaire something like emotion or personality, you get the big five. So it's not obvious that you could derive something like a life satisfaction or happiness questionnaire and have it measure something separate from the big five. And so what happens is that most people who report that they're satisfied with life or happy are high in extroversion they're happy, and low in neuroticism. They're not unhappy. So that eats up a big chunk of the variance, and and, and unsurprisingly, right? And so that sort of puts whether you're happy or satisfied with your life firmly in the domain of temperament. But it does turn out that conscientiousness also influences that, especially over longer spans of time. So hard work pays off. But, But it's tricky, too, because you also have to understand that hard work only pays off in a society that's very stable. And so maybe that's part of the the reason for the association between industriousness and orderliness, right? Because maybe you work really hard to gather up your little pile of, of uh, what would you call, acquisitions and assets, which you need, obviously, and then the whole society collapses and, you know, the thugs come in and steal it all. It's like, aren't you stupid? Because you should have just spent all that money before the thugs could steal it. And that's obviously the case in very many human societies. It's dangerous to be industrious because you'll gather up property that's valuable and then that just makes you a target. So it might be that industriousness doesn't pay off without order, something like that. So, and I've also wondered too, it's like, well, I'll I'll talk talk to you about that a little bit later. Okay, now recently, uh, researcher Fayard, also working with Roberts, 
was looking at the emotions that might be associated with conscientiousness. And this is rather a new approach because we kind of thought that we had the emotions tied up already in the big five, right? There were the positive emotions, and they loaded on extroversion, that's nice and simple, and there were the negative emotions, and they loaded on neuroticism, and that's that. But it turns out that that's not that, that there are emotions that fall outside of the, the rubric of simply negative neuroticism and simply positive extroversion, and they seem to be what people have often called like social emotions. And so those would be guilt and shame, those are two of them. Because, like, you feel guilty maybe when you haven't lived up to an obligation. And so an obligation is usually something that occurs because it's, you're embedded in a social context. And you feel ashamed. The distinction between guilt and shame is a tricky one. You feel guilt for yourself and shame in front of other people. Something like that. You know, and Guilt won't ne necessarily make you turn red, but shame will. And so there's, you know, there's actual behavioral displays that are associated with these emotions. Turns out that conscientiousness is associated with guilt proneness, but not the experience of guilt. That's a tricky thing. So let's say you're prone to guilt. Well, that'll make you conscientious. And if you're conscientious enough, you do the things you're supposed to do, then you don't have to feel guilt. So you can see why that would be rather tricky to discover. So guilt seems to be associated with conscientiousness. And although this hasn't been assessed yet, we think that it's it may be particularly associated with industriousness rather than orderliness. And the reason I'm positing that, and it's not demonstrated yet, the reason I'm positing that is because we know that orderliness is associated with something else. It's associated with sensitivity to disgust. And disgust is a whole different emotion than fear or, or pain, let's say. And